the only way to turn rage into something good is to be doing something to, to try to prevent such an atrocity happening again. That's the only way to feel that you're using all your energy to stop it happening again. Dr. Jane Goodall's parting words to me when we met in June of last year has become a, a sort of mantra of mine because, because I do struggle. You know, I, I struggle to understand how a civilization as advanced as ours can still be so savage. And I, I struggle to understand how governments that are, are put in charge to protect our natural heritage can stand back so blatantly and just watch our elephants and rhinos being slaughtered into extinction. So persistently seeking solutions and, and knowing the solutions are out there is, well, it, it keeps me sane. And I'm just continually inspired by the people out there that have done it harder so that we can walk further. These past few months, I've been writing stories from the front line, traveling through South Africa, into Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. But even before I returned to my homeland, I'd interviewed many global thought leaders engaged in the protein crisis. And every single story provided a piece of the puzzle in this battlefield of poverty and greed. Halfway through 2014, I interviewed Peter Knights, executive director of Wild Aid. And he pointed out, compared to frontline work, only a tiny fraction of funding is going to demand reduction. And yet we have a history of curbing the demand. Europe, no longer a major consumer of ivory, and Taiwan, once the biggest consumer of rhino horn, it's not even on the map anymore. Wildlife goods are not addictive. It's not associated with poverty and it's not mind altering. And so we have a real opportunity to curb the trade through a demand side approach. The sins of the father must end in this generation. Back in Africa, it's time for a new story. The African Wildlife Foundation is one of the few NGOs that is harnessing the power of impact investment to create sustainable livelihoods for impoverished Africans living near wildlife. And I've seen firsthand in my recent travels that the creation of jobs has had a direct impact on poaching literally collapsing in those areas. You know, we, we, we can no longer afford to, to put poverty into the unsolvable box. You know, poverty and our natural resources will continue to be an exploitable phenomenon until the world wakes up and starts investing in both people and planet. You know, the illegal wildlife trade is valued at nearly 20 billion US dollars. It's up there with human trafficking, narcotics and arms. And these wildlife crimes are, are filling the coffers of terrorist organizations. Al-Shabaab, Laws Resistance Army, Boko Haram, until society realizes that these animal issues are also human issues, we will never be able to effectively problem solve our way out of this wildlife holocaust. If not properly addressed, the sickening trade will go on to dismantle African economies intrinsically reliant on tourism, causing more job losses and fueling more conflict. And it's not the poachers getting rich, it's the middlemen and the criminal syndicates and these untouchable kingpins in Far East lands. But poaching is not considered high risk, with conviction rates as low as 7%. And so the temptation is huge. The criminals are literally laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, really, what is the point of having laws if it doesn't serve as a deterrent? While I was in Zimbabwe last year, I, I met Lisa Highwood, who's the, the founder of the Tiki Howard Trust, uh, world leaders in pangolin conservation. The pangolin. I mean, it's the most trafficked mammal in the world, and it's not even on the radar for most people. And uh, I just think, how are we ever going to save the little things if we can't save the big things? Now, in Zimbabwe, ironically, a country where terror and corruption reign, they now, thanks to the dedication of a few people, have some of the strongest conservation laws in the world. But... None of this even matters unless the laws are implemented. You know, we, we have to do whatever we can to support our brave rangers on the front line that are risking their lives to save what little wildlife we have left. But what happens when the poacher gets arrested? 
Well, if you follow the poaching crisis closely, you would find yourself grinding your teeth regularly at the sight of yet another criminal getting away with murder, whether by dockets mysteriously disappearing, even suspects disappearing from their cells, or skipping bail, or, or feeble jail sentences that are hardly a deterrent. A few years ago, the penalty for poaching a rhino in Zimbabwe was a couple hundred dollars. The minimum sentence is now 120,000 US dollars, 17 years in jail, and no bail. This is something that was changed through Parliament, simultaneously increasing the fines for all wildlife that is poached within Zimbabwe. In the past, poaching a pangolin never even carried a jail sentence. Last year, nine pangolin poachers in Zim were all sentenced to nine years in jail, the maximum sentence. Now this streak of prosecution success was down to two things. Firstly, Lisa Howard closely follows the pangolin poaching cases through every stage in the process, using a sort of uh, buddy system. She's working with national parks, police, the Central Intelligence Department, making sure the charges and affidavit are correct. And secondly, workshops were held for the magistrates, the enforcers. And through these workshops, they soon realized the value of all these various animals to the economy, and that they had the authority to implement the law and protect our heritage. In southern Kenya recently, law enforcement workshops were hosted by AWF and Kenya Wildlife Service, and this too had a direct impact on an elephant poacher getting convicted. A rare success. Yeah, I believe that uh, 2015 is going to be a big year for justice. I think uh, we'll start to see a lot more of these workshops right across Africa, and I think we'll start to see amendments to legislation. Uh, but. We do need a watchdog, we do need a buddy system um, to make sure that, that corruption does not permeate the corridors of law. You know, corruption, it's not going anywhere. But um, every chance we get, we need, to, we need to name and shame the syndicates and the suits. Because then governments will be forced to take action. I recently spoke with uh, Alan Thornton, founder of the Environmental Investigation Agency. And he firmly believes that if China and Japan closed down the domestic ivory trade today and enforced it, poaching would start to decline immediately across Africa. This is what happened after the 1989 ivory ban was introduced. Within a few months, the trade just plummeted across Asia because the markets were shut down. Similar story with rhino horn. In the early 90s, when the previous rhino poaching surge happened, EIA did investigations in China and Taiwan. Undercover documented footage and worldwide media coverage resulted in domestic bans being enforced in both countries. And then rhino poaching collapsed. From the 80s poaching crisis to the current poaching crisis, some of the players have changed. New markets have emerged, but there are many lessons from the past that we can learn from, and we must. Because if we do not take the lessons of the past, we are doomed to repeat. The war on poaching is a war on greed, but what we stand to lose is priceless.